Hello, and welcome to Cabinet Conversations. My name is Erica Scott, and I am the Artistic Programming Manager of Ford's Theater. If you are joining us for the first time, this is our live series exploring creativity, history, and leadership. You can learn more and explore our past programs by visiting our website, www.fords.org. Today, as DC prepares for tomorrow's 2020 Commitment March, our participants reflect on the original event marking the 57th anniversary. I am pleased to welcome Ms. Edith Lee Payne and Dr. George Derrick Musgrove to talk about the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. George Derrick Musgrove is an Associate Professor of History at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He is the author of Rumor, Repression, and Racial Politics and co-author with Chris Myers Ash of the book Chocolate City, A History of Race and Democracy in the Nation's Capital. A DC resident, Musgrove is currently developing a web-based map of the history of black power activism in our capital city from 1961 to 1998. Edith Lee Payne has been an activist for social justice in the areas of education, housing, public safety, police and community relations, and civil rights spanning more than four decades. In 2008, Edith learned that she had a permanent place in history after discovering that three photographs taken of her at the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom are among the holdings of the National Archives and Records Administration. One of the photos of the then 12-year-old Edith with a look of quiet reflection as she holds a banner for the march was widely used in brochures, textbooks, films, and documentaries about the march. The images now offer her additional opportunities to discuss the day that cemented her desire to fight injustice. I am also very pleased to have joining us John W. White as moderator for today's cabinet conversation. John is an associate professor of American studies at Christopher Newport University and former president of the Abraham Lincoln Institute. Welcome to each of you. Thank you. As a reminder to all viewers, we are taking questions on our social media platforms. Please feel free to submit so that we can share your questions with our guests during the program. And now, John, take it away. Thank you so much, Erica. And thank you to the team at Fords for inviting us to be part of this really exciting conversation. We're here today to talk about one of the most important events in American history. Before we get into the details about the March on Washington, though, I wanted to place it within its broader historical context. Derek, could you start us off by giving us a sense of what black activism looked like in Washington, DC in the 19th and 20th centuries? And what sort of figure did Abraham Lincoln play as a symbol in African-American politics at that time? Well, sure, Jonathan, thank you for the question. And thanks to the folks at Ford for uh, inviting me. Um, and there's really two eras in African-American protests when it comes to using Lincoln as a symbol to, to advance their, their, their uh, request for and their demand for uh, full citizenship rights. The first is the late 19th century. Uh, and most people out D, outside of DC don't know this, but there are two national monuments to Abraham Lincoln in the city. There's three statues to Lincoln in the city, uh, but two of them are, are specifically national. Uh, the first, the oldest one, is in Lincoln Park, and it's the Emancipation Memorial, which was dedicated in 1876. And African Americans uh, marched to the dedication of that memorial in their Emancipation Day parade, which was scheduled for just a few days uh, after the unveiling. And they would march to that statue every single year for the next quarter century. Um, and the key sort of element of their protest at that uh, memorial was to demand the full rights promised them in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, uh, rights that they understood Lincoln as prosecuting the war to eventually give to them, uh, and that the promise of Reconstruction was going to provide for them. Uh, and so that was the key sort of Lincoln Memorial uh, protest site uh, prior to in, in the late 19th century. Now, uh, in 1922, the Lincoln Memorial is dedicated down on the mall. And oddly enough, it's a segregated affair. African-Americans are shunted off to a little segregated area. Uh, and the focus is really not on Lincoln, the great emancipator at that event, but Lincoln, sort of the, the, the president and the statesman. Uh, 
African Americans, though, re reappropriate the memorial through a couple of protests before 1963. Uh, the first is in uh, the late 1930s when um, uh, the great uh, singer um, Anderson, why is her Marian first name? Marian Anderson. Marian Anderson, thank yeah. you. Uh, was essentially denied access to two different auditoriums here in the city because of segregation uh, being practiced by the owners of those auditoriums. One being a city-owned auditorium at Central High School, the other being the Daughters of the American Revolution. And so uh, her allies in, in the federal government, in the Roosevelt administration, uh, decided to hold uh, the event uh, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Uh, and from that point forward, African Americans increasingly began to use the Lincoln Memorial as the sort of primary national site for demanding full citizenship rights and jobs. Uh, for the rest of the 20th century. And so in 1957, you had uh, the pilgrimage for the vote. 1963, you had the March on Washington. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Edith, you were there on that day in August 1963. I can't imagine what that experience would have been like. Can you tell our viewers about that moment in your life and what you remember most about it? Sure. Thank you for the question. And thank you also. Um, Board Theater for inviting me. I um, remember the day vividly. Uh, first of all, because it was my birthday. It was my 12th oh, wow. birthday. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, but also, I was inspired to be there because Dr. King had visited Detroit a few months prior, actually in June, led the then largest march of some 125,000 people later learned, um, but he invited people to come to the march um, on Washington. Um, so to see this huge sea of people of all walks of life, races, creeds, and colors, um, I was inspired by it. Uh, even though I was 12, I was kind of an old 12, an old soul as, as, as people would say. Um, but it was a, a day of just, camaraderie. I mean, there was people were just getting along, but that's what I was used to growing up in the North. Uh, people getting along in stark contrast to the way it was in, in Southern states. Hmm. So let me say, because you have a birthday coming up then, right? Tomorrow, yes. Tomorrow, right. So happy birthday for tomorrow. And um, thank you. Who, who did you go with when you went to the march? My mother, uh, we took the Greyhound bus. We actually went the weekend before the that Wednesday, the August 28th. Um, Washington, D.C. was my mother's home. So going to D.C. was something that we did every summer. And she obviously decided that we would she would schedule our summer vacation so we could be there for that March. We stayed with my aunt, uh, whom I'm named after, my Aunt Edith. And we arrived at the march early because my aunt uh, was a Red Cross volunteer. Okay. So we left the house early, went to a Red Cross building, picked up a truck, then uh, proceeded on to the grounds of the, of the monument. So we kind of had an advantage. We were there early before the buses started rolling in and people were arriving on trains. So when I got there, I could still see the grass and the ground and the the uh, flags surrounding um, the monument, uh, but it after it seemed like maybe an hour or so, you you couldn't see anything but people, and and then mm -hmm. hear music and Peter Paul and Mary, they you know they started it off at at the Lincoln Memorial, and uh, but it, they were people that I was accustomed to hearing, so it was a good moment, it, and it was one that I've lived with as as a moment of honor you know, every year since. And of course, finding out a picture just made it all the more special and confirmed that being a civil rights activist was what I was destined to be. Well, that's incredible. Derek, I was curious, how did you first become interested in the history of black activism in our nation's capital? And from a historian's perspective, what aspects of the march, the speeches or the other activities really stand out to you uh, as having long-lasting significance. Hmm. 
Well, the, the story of me uh, getting involved in, in uh, the, the study of black activism in DC is an odd one. I, the, the simple answer is that I was assigned the DC history course when I used to teach at the University of the District of Columbia. And I didn't know anything about it. So I really quickly figured it out uh, and, and grabbed every book I could. Um, but the long answer is that uh, even before I got that job, uh, I was really interested in these uh, figures who were quintessentially DC figures, people like Marion Barry, Walter Fontroy, uh, and who were either in attendance at the march or in the case of Walter Fontroy was the primary local organizer for mm -hmm. the march. Um, and I found that they had tremendous reach beyond the city. And that seemed positively bizarre to me uh, one, because D.C. is a small place, but also because at the time that the, the March on Washington occurred, D.C. did not even have home rule. Right. Uh, not only did we not have representation in Congress at the time, but we didn't have a city government. We were ruled by three uh, presidentially appointed commissioners. Uh, and only two years before the march was any one of them black for the first time in 80 years, yeah. um, even though the city at the time was was thoroughly majority black. Uh, and so, so, you know, all of these interesting contradictions, uh, you know, uh, people who are exerting power from a powerless place, um, a, a segregated city uh, with no democracy hosting at that point one of the largest, uh, um, uh, you know, protests for democracy uh, in the 1960s. Uh, it all just became very attractive and I wanted to know more. Hmm. Um, now to your, your second question. Um, you know, one of the things I find most Im interesting about the 63 March, because we tend to talk about it as the March on Washington. Right. And A. Philip Randolph was very clear in his remarks at the March. Um, he said, this is the first wave and we will continue to come back to press our demands until full of freedom is achieved for African-Americans. Uh, and so what you see after 63 is a succession of marches seeking to um, uh, sort of uh, achieve the unfinished objectives of the 63 March. There's a massive mm -hmm. march in 1983 uh, where 300,000 African-Americans come to Washington, D.C. for that protest. Many of the original uh, uh, speakers and organizers are part of that mobilization. And it's an effort to kind of push back against the racially reactionary policies of the Reagan administration and really tee up uh, to tee up a, a new coalition and pull the Democratic Party to the left in anticipation of 1984. Hmm. Um, in 1993, there's another march. Uh, and interestingly, uh, some of our current leadership comes out of that march. Uh, Stacey Abrams was a student activist from Spelman College in Georgia. Uh, and she spoke at the 1993 march. She's done a few things since. Um, but then you, you get the 2013 50th anniversary march, and then you get all of these other marches, of course, that have a slightly different tradition, but they're basically following the same playbook, whether it's the Poor People's Campaign in 1968, the Al Sharpton's March Against Police Brutality in 1999, mm -hmm. and today in 2020, the National Action Network's uh, protest against police brutality, but also for uh, full equality uh, and jobs uh, that, that's going on tomorrow. And I should just point out, I would be remiss if I didn't say this, uh, the principal uh, organizer for tomorrow's march, who is the director of the DC uh, branch of the National Action Network, is Ebony Riley. And she is an alumnus of UMBC, and we are tremendously proud of oh, her. Oh, wow. That's great. Have you had her in class? I, I didn't, but I, was, I, was, I advised her a little bit. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, Edith, today when we think about and sorry, Derek, I'm going to say the march, even in, in light of what you just said. But today, when we think about the march, I think most Americans, their mind first goes to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. I mean, I think it's the most well-known aspect of the march. And I was wondering, what were your reactions when you first heard it? Did you, did you have a sense of just how far of a reach it would have that generations later we would still be, you know, I show it in my classes every year. My students see it. I make them read it. Did, did you have a sense of just how incredible it was in the moment or what were your reactions to it? Well, actually, um, no, I, I didn't. And it wasn't the first time that I heard him say, I have a dream. Right. He said that in his right. speech in June to us in Detroit. So some of us claim that that was actually the first I have a dream speech, but actually it wasn't because he used that refrain in North Carolina even before that. Yeah. 
Um, the reason yeah. for that march in August, the August 20th, 1963 march, so significant um, as opposed to those that have come after is the organization aspect of it, the purpose of it, the strategy of it, the leadership of it. There has not been that kind of a march. There have been people in large numbers assembled in Washington, D.C. at Lincoln's Memorial, but it lacked those, it, 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 they all have purpose. Purpose is always there, but it didn't have the strategy to accomplish the goals. It still doesn't have the leadership and it was comprehensive leadership in the 60s. Um, besides Dr. King, there, there was, as you mentioned earlier, A. Philip Randolph, and there was the, the leader of the NAACP and the Detroit Urban League. Um, and then there were others, but then there were legions of ecumenical leadership throughout the country that would connect to Walter Funchoy and other leaders. So the representation is not as relevant as one would think. It was a spiritual movement. And because the people that I stood on that day were led by and believed in a higher authority. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I'm not gonna say God because that may not have been what, their, what they considered their creator. But because they were guided by something that was bigger than they and the hope that they had in that bigger uh, um, authority, that was all the central focus of that march. And we don't have that now. We don't have that leadership. One person cannot be a leader. It can't be an Al Sharpton. It can't be just a Jesse Jackson. It needs to be a collective effort. And the civil rights movement was successful where we see things that came out of it, such as the Montgomery bus boycott that showed with organization and strategy and commitment and dedication and fearlessness meant when you did something and then you saw an accomplishment. What happened in Selma and what John Lewis and others experienced and they came back again and again and we got a Voting Rights Act and a Civil Rights Act. Out of the Civil Rights Movement was a, was a purpose, a dedicated, committed purpose and we're not going to stop until that those things are achieved. Sadly, April 4th, 1968, is when it stopped because mm. no mm. one stepped up collectively from any organizations and said there are still things that need to be done we still have problems in housing we still have problems in employment um we still have problems in education and while some of these organizations still exist they have not found a way to collectively come together and sit in an oval office or sit in a governor's office or sit somewhere and get the things done that need to be done. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot there. I mean, just thinking about the legacy of King and of the leaders as a whole who are working so collaboratively. You mentioned John Lewis in, your, in what you just said. Do you re remember his speech when you were there that day? I do. I, I do remember his speech. I, and I fortunately had an opportunity to meet him uh, three years ago at a Congressional Black Caucus um, meeting. Yeah. Were there uh, any other of the speeches or the musicians? I'm a big Bob Dylan fan. I know he was there. Uh, were there any other of the speeches or the musicians? I know there were a lot of celebrities there that, that stood out to you as, as a 12 year old seeing these people. Yes. Peter, Paul and Mary. I love them. Um, Mahalia Jackson during the other part of the March, I was at Lincoln Memorial. She stood out to me because my mother had her albums. So I'd listened to her music a lot. And then I saw her in a movie, uh, imitation of life. And uh, so seeing her was pretty amazing. My mother saw Lena Horne. Hmm. Lena Horne actually came over to speak to my mom because they were both in the entertainment field. Um, my mother before she uh, married and started a family. And they reminisced about the experiences they had in the South uh, and you know why they were there at the March. That was the first time I ever knew 
that my mother had had any any kind of racial experiences in her lifetime with overhearing that conversation. Right. Wow. Derek, I, I wanted to ask you a question as a college professor, when you teach about the march, what is it, what are some of the most important points? And again, forgive me for just calling it the march. When you teach about the march on Washington for, uh, for freedom jobs, what what is it that you try to get your students to take home that they might not know before they take a class with you? Hmm. Well, you know, typically when I'm, I'm, I get to this point in the civil rights movement, uh, my students are reading Ann Moody's Coming of Age in Mississippi, which mm-hmm. is one of the best memoirs, uh, I think, out there on uh, not just growing up black and poor in the South, but on, on the early civil rights movement. And I encourage a- everyone who's listening to pick it up if you haven't already. Um, and Moody is really quite um, burnt out uh, by the time she, the, she gets to the march. Uh, She's a SNCC activist from Centerville, Mississippi, uh, in the southwest corner of the state. Uh, And uh, she is constantly threatened uh, with police brutality, with uh, vigilante violence. Her family is threatened. Um, uh, You know, so she is by the time she gets to the march, she's really about to snap. And she sort of sees the march as a distraction. You know, her belief is that uh, change happens on the ground. Uh, you, in fact, have to organize communities to seize power. Uh, and she's thinking specifically of Mississippi and of the Black Belt counties in Mississippi, where if Black folks can just get access to the vote, they'll, in fact, be the voting majority in those areas. Um, so I then have to, you know, sort of counterbalance that a little bit and, and point out to my students that uh, low-level politics, uh, sort of grassroots politics, is terribly important uh, and is a driver of the movement. But one of the things that makes the heroic period of the civil rights movement from 1954, when you have Brown versus Board, to roughly 1968, when you have the federal ho- uh, the Fair Housing Act, is that you get this, this really wonderful uh, combination of grassroots and high level uh, uh, politics. Uh, and so you've got this large coalition at the march uh, of people who are generally within the Democratic coalition, but there's also huge numbers of liberal Republicans, organized labor, religious organizations of, of, of various faiths. Um, and one of the things I think that's wonderful that you see at the march is the tremendous amount of uh, sort of negotiation that goes mm-hmm. into building that majority coalition uh, that eventually pushes the Civil Rights Act of 1964 through Congress, but some of the people in that coalition are reluctant to do that. Um, uh, Whereas, you know, many of the people that we focus on on the stage are determined, absolutely determined to do that. And so trying to get my students to understand, you know, why I say um, the, uh, you know, some of the Jewish groups that are there are backing the march is this wonderful uh, sort of teachable moment in contemporary world history. Uh, You have people like Rabbi Prince um, from the American Jewish Congress. And he just says flat out, I remember the Holocaust. That's why we're here, Hmm. right? And so so it it helps us, I think, to understand this moment in the history of liberalism and and in the the liberal coalition, which at that moment is a a bipartisan coalition, uh, but also still the tensions within that coalition. Right. Can you say again for our viewers the name and author of the book that you assign? Yes, uh, Ann Moody's Coming of Age in Mississippi. Uh, and it is, is about a 400 page memoir and it's, it's just wonderful. Are there other speeches from either the March on Washington or the era that you assign in your courses that you find resonate really well with 21st century students who are interested in racial egalitarianism and, and social justice? Yeah, you know, I, I, I like, um, you know, uh, Whitney Young's speech. Oddly enough, he's seen as a moderate, but his speech is really quite radical if you, if you read it closely. And what I tend to do with my students, because I'm, I'm fighting against very specific uh, stories that they know about the march or that mm-hmm. they have learned over the last couple of years about the march. And I think One of the big stories is that Martin Luther King was very tame, was not really trying to rock the boat, was very moderate, uh, sort of a milk toast, you know, well, let's just all get along type of civil rights leader. And then I I forced them to read his I Have a Dream speech closely 
and, and not that last part where he sort of goes off into uh, the oratory that we know so well with I Have a Dream, um, but the part where he's really, that, that's scripted, that's sort of laid out. And there's just this one line, I wanna read it to you all because it throws my students for a loop and it really resonates with them hmm. today. And he says this, there will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. I mean, he's talking about messing things up. He's talking about grinding the country to a halt. He's talking about creating problems. Um, and that I think helps us to remember uh, how radical uh, what we now consider a very moderate movement uh, was. Right. Yeah, I don't think that line gets quoted as much as things at the beginning where he's talking about the Declaration of Independence and standing in Lincoln's shadow and then mm -hmm. uh, the peroration at the end. Edith, I, I want to talk about these photographs of you, and I think we're going to be able to pull them up and, and show them on the screen. Can you tell us the story behind the three photographs, do you, do you remember the pictures being taken? And then can you also tell the story about how you found out about them so many years later? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I, first of all, no, I didn't know that the pictures had been taken. Um, I didn't learn about that until 2008 when my cousin saw a Black History Calendar uh, catalog and saw my picture on the back cover uh, and phoned me and told me that, you know, I was on this picture with Dr. King and Sojourner Truth and Frederick Douglass and all these other famous um, African-Americans. Uh, so I remember my mother getting that pennant for me. I remember standing there, but I had no idea whatsoever that, uh, that that picture had been captured by the person we now know to be Roland Sherman, who was hired by the U.S. Information Agency to take pictures of the March on Washington. What was your reaction when you first came across it? When I first saw the picture, I did not believe that it was me. I couldn't believe it because, as I said, it was on a Black History calendar with all these famous people, and uh, also on the back cover was a little Rock Nine, and then there was that picture that we're familiar with of the four colored, um, you know, colored only, white only drinking fountains or at a, a um, train station. So it did not fathom to me that that was me. So it took a phone call to someone asking them to look at it and see if they thought it was me and they said it was, but it took a stranger that happened to be passing by and saw me looking at it on a, on a computer screen and said, who's a guest at a hotel where I was staying, and he said, oh, that's a nice picture of you. And because he didn't know me at 12, he didn't know me actually other than in passing. That's what convinced me that it, that it, it was me. So yeah, I've been amazed at all the places that I've seen that photograph show up in documentaries and even a textbook in um, the South of France. Wow. Edith, how, how did that, day in in your life sort of set your mind towards the trajectory that you would take in pushing for social justice and civil rights? How did uh, that moment or um, being taken there with your mother, how did that help you or push you towards a, right, uh, a life as a civil rights activist? Well, the way I was raised by my mom, was to always stand up for what I believed in, to always, of course, to be respectful. I had come to, to know Dr. King's teachings and, and what he believed in and the civil rights movement, having seen some things in our uh, local publications of people being killed or you know crosses being burned and things like that. And of course I knew that was wrong because where I lived in Detroit, here in Detroit, um, those things didn't happen. We took public transportation. We sat wherever we wanted to. We ate at lunch counters. We were served by white and black waitresses. Everybody got along. I lived the dream that Dr. King talked about. But as I came to know that people did not live that same way, and I knew some of the people that, that I was standing with at the march came from other places, 
but because of that that bond that that we had that bond of hope i guess faith that things would get better i didn't know if i was sitting next to someone from the north or someone from the south dr king was not an agitator but could agitate if need be and but because he was he was guided not by just the things that he was advocating for and had us was leading marches for dr king if you put in priority him and and i'm equating myself with that too and and how i am he god was first um his purpose was second his family was third and he was last when you chronicled your life with its purpose and who gave you that purpose there's nothing that you won't do but you also do it out of a sense of love so in that part of the speech that was mentioned certainly he would be more than willing to do anything that he needed to but he was not going to come out of the context of his of the nonviolent movement and that's important to note it's 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 no either or it was always nonviolent, period. And but the agitation part to get whatever it is that we need to get, the consistency, the commitment, that's what was there. My admiration and respect for Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and I looked at him more as a reverend than I did as a speaker. Hmm. Um, so his speech has always resonated with me because his speech has always contained scripture. Right. So when you go to church every Sunday and you see that person standing there on the pulpit and they're speaking to you and they're referencing scripture, that's how I viewed him. So the motivation started actually before the speech and it was part of the way that I grew up as well. Wow. Yeah, I think that what you're saying is really important. When I think when people today read a lot of his speeches or writings, those biblical allusions that you're referring to just sort of go right past because we're not as biblically literate of a people anymore. And when I teach Letter from Birmingham Jail, or the I have a dream speech, I always, I try to point out how he's, he's talking about a self-sacrificial form of love. And he says, we're all going to be an extremist, but are we going to be an extremist for love or for hate? And that he has that biblical understanding of, I can show love for my nation or for my people or for my enemies by sacrificing myself. And it, it's, it's so much, it's so powerful, I think, for people to hear today because we often don't hear that sort of language anymore. And then when you put that up with images of Birmingham or something and show how his followers suffered, um, it makes it, I think, all the more powerful for younger people today to see and to be um, inspired by or awed by. I, I was thinking about it as I was uh, thinking about our conversation today. I think that the first time I encountered the march, was in an episode of The Cosby Show from 1986 called The March. Have either of you seen that? Uh, Theo, you know, Theo Huxtable, he has to write a paper and he does a really poor job on it and gets a C minus or something and gets in trouble with his parents. And then his grandparents all come over that weekend and all four of his grandparents and his parents, and of course it's all fictional, but they all had been at the march. And so they all reminisce in front of Theo and inspire him to do a better job on his homework. And when they reminisce about it, they they talk about the peaceful nature of the march, the loving nature of the people who were there, the concern that they showed for one another. And that episode always struck me. And I, I was curious, Derek, could you talk about the the role of this particular event in African American memory from the '60s to the present. And I know it's a broad topic, um, but if you could speak to that, because I think it would get at sort of the significance of this in popular memory a bit. Yeah. You, so I think the march has had, you know, it, it's had sort of two different paths, and they've really they've diverged quite sharply in our in our popular memory uh, since 1963. Uh, one is, is I think, the, the sort of African-American based uh, or, or, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, African-American based memory of the march. And that is that it was a high point of the nonviolent civil rights movement. Um, but, it, but, you know, it sort of retains a lot of the 
uh, understanding about the danger of nonviolent mm -hmm. protest at that time and the opposition uh, to nonviolent protest at that time. I mean, I think a lot of people forget that, you know, business owners, white business owners here in D.C., congressmen uh, sent their secretaries home early, fearful that all these black people in the city uh, would coming into the city would, in fact, uh, create a riotous environment and, and uh, people would be subject to robbery and rape and, and all of these other crimes. Um, and so large numbers of white D.C. residents just sort of cleared out. Uh, which to me, looking back, seems bizarre because the city was already majority black at the time, but I digress. Mm. Um, and so th there's this African-American memory, I think, that holds some of that alongside the, the soaring rhetoric of, of King in our popular understanding. Um, then, and in, in, in here I'm borrowing from, from Jacqueline Dowd Hall and, and other historians who have, have sort of looked at the uh, the ways in which conservatives have molded a memory of the march, mm. and and what they essentially say, and this is conservatives of all races and, and of different and of uh, different political parties, and they essentially say, look, this was this was a nonviolent march. Um, you know, these people didn't really disturb a lot of people. Um, they were, uh, you know, they were, you know, sort of what we should hold up as uh, a protester and as the way to protest. And then what they do is they take that. Uh, memory, and they say, and look what happened afterwards. You had the Poor People's Campaign, and it, and it sort of broke up with tear gas and the police having to clear out the place. And look what you had with Black Power. Those people, uh, you know, were really focused on race hatred and violence. Not true, by the way. Um, and so everything that happens afterwards, which in fact, if you go back to the, the quote I gave you from A. Philip Randolph, was really a continuation of a lot mm. of the pleas that were put forward at the 1963 March on Washington. What they do is they take that more contemporary black protest and say, this is illegitimate. And what you should be doing is what happened in 1963. They of mm. course leave out that most of the people that have been saying that since 1963, in fact, opposed the legitimate claims of the marchers in 1963. And I'll give you an example. Right. Um, the famous conservative hero, Ronald Reagan, who you know would go back and praise uh, King's speeches uh, from the March on King's speech from the March on Washington, opposed the the Civil Rights Act of 1964, opposed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, um, but then would turn around when he was president in the 1980s and say, "Oh, that march was so good. I wish black people would act like that today." Uh, and so those are, I think, are the two different ways in which we've remembered the march. Um, and they've diverged very sharply along ideological and partisan lines. Hmm. I, there was a 50th anniversary commemoration in 2013. Were either mm -hmm. of you at that? I was not. You were not? Edith, were you? I was there and the same photographer that took my picture in 1963 took it again in 2013 with the banner, but this time with two of my granddaughters. Oh, wow. Can you talk about uh, yeah. your experience there? Um, yes, I'd, I'd, I'd love to. I came back because obviously having been there 50 years ago and knowing that there was an agenda um, that was being sought by the, the leaders of the civil rights movement and knowing where we are, where we were then and where we are today, I expected there to be an agenda because we're on this platform and that's the purpose of the mall for the citizens of the country to bring whatever their concerns are there for you know members of Congress and Washington and the world to see. But sadly, as I mentioned before, because of the lack of leadership and everybody was there represented the organizations that people believe are black organizations or represent black uh, communities. Um, no one, no one wanted to do anything. Mm. We here in Detroit mm. were facing the emergency manager law, which you know what caused the Flint water crisis where an appointed person was able to have unilateral authority over the people that we elected. Well, here we are after all these years of, of the Voting Rights Act, and we were able to vote for our city council, our mayor, and our school board members, but this person, this appointed person by the governor, 
had more authority than the people that we elected. So, I, I mean, our votes were subverted to a, to a large degree. And I thought that was a major thing. I talked to leaders about it. I talked to Jesse Jackson about it. I talked to um, Al Sharpton. I talked to them. I'm like, we need, this is an, our opportunity to put this on the national stage. But unfortunately, you know, it didn't happen and it just continued to get worse. And the fear of course was if it happened here, we're at one point over 50%, 51% of the population of Michigan was under emergency management when Detroit um, became under, had an emergency manager both in the school district and, and with the city. It was a different time in 2013 because there was more social things going on and mm. you know recognition, but the the seriousness, the the, the purpose of the movement of, of what transpired 50 years ago, um, it didn't get, again, my opinion, didn't garner the attention and the opportunity to move us forward. You know, let, let's let's remember what happened what was accomplished, you know, 50 years ago. And we have these things that need to be done. Let's let, let's now bring them to the table and then see what happens. But, you know, that, that just hasn't happened. Right. 10 wow. years after the 1963 March, I had never experienced racism until I, I got married and moved to Washington, D.C. and couldn't get a job because I was black. So... The mantle hasn't been passed or it was dropped and it needs to be picked up and it needs to be continued. And people need to understand from people who have experienced the the, the racial injustices, what it really means. So they can, you know, better understand and appreciate and know what can I do? Because the white people that joined us in 1963, they had a compassion and an understanding like Sally Liuzzo. She heard Dr. King. She knew, she felt within herself there was something she needed to do and she knew the risk and she did it. Well, there were a lot of people like her. So, you know, that's that's where we are. And if we are going to go forward and we need to, I have five grandsons and a great grandson. I don't want to see them getting in their car and shot in their back seven times. I don't want that. I don't want them to need just because. So the things that we've gotten away from whenever law enforcement, for example, uh, has the occasion to um, apprehend a suspect when all they're supposed to do is handcuff them and place them in the car and take them where, where they're supposed to go. Though That's a simple basic thing that needs to happen. There's no reason for people to be placed on the ground. There's no reason for four or five people to be on one person on the ground. So, I mean, it, it doesn't take a lot of conversations to stop this. It means stop it. You have the right people at the table and it, it just doesn't continue. You, you don't do it. And then when it happens, it doesn't take several months to decide what to do with that officer who has, been, who has obviously committed a crime. And I say this objectively because I was the wife of a police officer. Hmm. So hmm. it's not an anti-police thing. It's a pro-human life thing. And it's just as much, we had two officers that were shot at last night here in Detroit. They weren't doing anything, but because of what other law enforcement has done uh, terribly to other people, it makes it open season for everybody. And I don't want to see that for them either. Yeah, as a follow-up, and this is a question that we got from a viewer, for people who are watching today, what can individual people do to be a champion for justice and equality in their own community? I would. Well, I'll certainly, oh, please. As, as, speaking as a civil rights activist and an organizer, what I tell students um, when I'm asked that question is to organize, to get with people of like-minded people, preferably, and decide on what it is that you want to address, if it's in your school, if it's in your community, or if it's in your home. And you make your list, whether it's one thing or it's three things, you decide on what it is that you wanna do, then you 
decide on how you have to do it. And then you give it a time frame. And then if it's a if plan A doesn't work, you do plan B. First and foremost, whatever you do, you do it in peace and love. Because anything else, it's only gonna antagonize the matter and things won't, you know, they, they just won't be, be well received. Um, people aren't going to always agree. In conjunction with the civil rights movement was a Stokely Carmichael that believed in black power. But he was on this side. Dr. King and, and his followers were on, on the other side. Um, you, you, everybody's not going to be on the same page. That's just the way it is. But we see today that what's celebrated and remember is what we're talking about right now, the March on Washington, the civil rights movement and nonviolence. We're not recognizing Stokely Carmichael and black power and an eye for an eye and because that's just not, that didn't move us in the direction that we needed to go. So I would say organize like-minded people, strategize, plan, meet your objective, and then go to the next thing. Derek, go ahead. And thank you, Edith. Well, sure. So, so I, I have to just uh, point out one thing, which is is that Stokely Carmichael was at the 1963 March on Washington, supported the 1968 Poor People's Campaign, and was probably the most important black political figure in D.C. history uh, during the 1960s, uh, be, besides Marion Barry. Uh, and so, so a, this, he certainly had a tremendous influence on this city, uh, and in many ways, a very positive one. I would argue, from my own research. Um, but when it comes to today, um, I, you know, I do think that uh, there's a real simple answer and it. You can actually go back to King's speech from 1963. I mean, he ends that speech by saying, now that you've come to the march, go back to Georgia, go right. back to Detroit, go back to, to New York and organize. Right. And, and, and Miss Lee Payne is absolutely right. Um, what you have to do is find the like minded people in your area, join those organizations. Uh, the city paper was very helpful just a couple of days ago, highlighted most of the new Black Lives Matter activists in the city. There's, of course, a well-established uh, uh, D.C. Black Lives Matter chapter. Uh, and then, of course, there are the folks that have been doing good work in D.C. for years, whether it was for statehood with D.C. Vote, Neighbors United for D.C. Statehood, uh, or One D.C., which deals with um, uh, affordable housing. Uh, and other uh, issues of access for poor people. Uh, and so, you know, those groups are out here. Uh, they're very active. They need your financial support. Uh, they need uh, your um, your hands and, and your feet uh, to knock doors and, and to help to to make them them run. So please check them out. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the things I think that Ms. Lee Payne also pointed out is that there is tremendous diversity within the current activist moment, just as there was during the civil rights movement. Uh, and so, you know, do your homework on these organizations so that you know that your interests line up with the people that you're you're joining up with. Oh, I have, we have time for one more question, I think. And it's something that a viewer asked about and I think connects to a, a lot of what you both have been saying about the memory of the march and who was there. And so, Derek, I'll ask you this. Can you tell us just very briefly about the media reaction to it? Uh, mainstream press or African American newspapers, local newspapers. How did the media respond? Yeah, the, so you know the, the person who asked the question is absolutely right to point out the Washington Post, the Evening Star, and and the Afro as sort of the two three representative papers in in DC region. Um, the Afro was doing what most black newspapers around the country were doing, which is advocating for the march and having a kind of insider African-American conversation about the march. And so I was reading some parts of the Chicago Defender today uh, in preparation where they were talking about whether or not that uh, Elijah Muhammad from the Nation of Islam was going to attend the march. And he was actually suggesting that he might. Uh, he, he ended up not doing so. Um, for the Evening Star, it was really the paper of kind of white working in lower middle class DC. And it was not particularly keen on the march, but it wasn't overtly hostile. Uh, it, it tried to be objective, but it certainly was not supportive. And the post was, you know, think of it, thought of itself then, and I think uh, still does today, is, is more of a middle class to upper class uh, white uh, DC paper, although today it, it would drop the white. Um, and, and so in the mid 1960s, it's trying to do objective reporting about the march and by and large focused on numbers, uh, focused on, um, you know, sort of logistics. 
and uh, a little bit of the behind the scenes negotiation between not, not just among uh, March uh, organizers, but also between March organizers and the administration. So those behind the scenes negotiations were known at the time or they were leaked from insiders? You know, it, it depends on which ones. I mean, like, you know, what we, we didn't know at the time that, that people like Adam Clayton Powell was kind of trying to strong arm the March organizers to have a, a more, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, impressive presence on the dais. He thought he deserved it. And he was planning on outing Bayard Rustin, who uh, was a closeted gay man, um, if he was not able to have a, a really good place at the March. Um, that didn't make the papers. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of the stuff about John Lewis uh, makes the papers, I think, after the march, if I recall correctly. Um, and that's because it was so last minute. It literally couldn't make deadline. Uh, and this oh, is, of wow. course, John Lewis's uh, speech, uh, which was objected to by a large number of the more moderate uh, speech organizers because he said things like, you know, we're going to leave this march and go back to the south and march through it like Sherman did. And of course, right. Uh, General William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, you know, led a devastating march uh, uh, through the South for the purpose of inflicting pain on the home front and getting the Confederacy to surrender. So th that metaphor didn't go over well uh, with some of the more moderate members of the, the committee. But that that didn't make the papers. Um, it, it was a question of like, you know, would Kennedy meet with the march organizers and the papers were reporting yes, and he did. Um, things like that. Wow. Well, thank you so much to you both. I think Erica is going to come back in here. Yep. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you to Miss Edith Lee Payne. Thank you, George Derek Musgrove. Thank you, John W. White. And Miss Edith, happy early birthday. We wish you many, many blessings and happiness on your day tomorrow and the rest of 2020, because Lord knows it's been a struggle. So many blessings to you. Much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to all who are watching. We will continue to respond to your Facebook and Twitter comments and questions that we didn't get to during the live session today. If you liked Cabinet Conversations today, please consider making a gift to support the mission and work of Ford's Theater. You can do so at fords.org slash donate. We hope that you will join us for our next Cabinet Conversation on September 24th. So until then, see you next time. <laughs>